Ladies and gentlemen, because we're once again like to introduce, I'm going to mess up his name. I know it's Peterson Toscano. Oh, I actually got it. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you everyone for coming to the film and uh, we'd love to hear uh, some of your questions. We'll be talking to Morgan and John Fox tonight and he's excited about what you all thought. Who's here on Saturday for the premiere? So if there are any um, questions or comments about the film, I'd love to hear that. And wave your hand so I can see it because it's got the light in my eyes. Thank you all there. I see that hand. <laughs> No, the blog, he did the blogging just um, a few days after he was told about going to the program, and then he was cut off. Oh, okay. And so we, we didn't even know what he was thinking after a while because it was just this sort of message in a bottle that was thrown out there, and people then thought, well, now what do we do? Okay. Anybody else? Questions? I uh, laughed, I cried. Fabulous, fabulous movie. And I'm wondering um, whether you know whether other people do in fact know this story so that they can mobilize campaigns uh, in other places where exodus is showing up. Well, I, I travel a lot talking about the ex gay movement, doing uh, lectures and such, and I'll often say, oh, I don't know if you heard a story about a six year old boy who was forced to attend back in 2005. And I'll have a lot of people, college students, who are like, yeah, I do remember that story. And in part, that's why we decided to do the film, because what we were really happy with was not only it's a tragic story of the awful things that adults can do to children, but it's a very <laughs> triumphant story of what can happen when a group of young people and others get together and organize. And, and we were like, it's not nice to be able to tell a good story of, of something that was able to change because of concerted, organized, thoughtful, loving, creative efforts. So we're hoping this will get around and, you know, and, and lots of people say it. And within the current climate with Michelle Bachman running for president and her husband offering this sort of reparative therapy, this is a big news story happening right now. We're hoping that, you know, this film could help highlight the sort of danger that can come from these treatments. Yes, right there. I was struck by how young all the uh, protesters were. Was it really that way, or were there any older people protesting? Uh, all, sort of all the initial protesters were high school students and college students. And they then brought the adults on board and helped the adults know how to do the protesting in a way that was thoughtful and loving. And it's reminiscent of the Stonewall Riots, which was a lot of young people, people of color, gender, non-conforming folks, trans folks, who then helped the other kind of more mainstream people come on board and get involved with, with the protests happening there. Yes? Um, what, is the, what was the legal basis for, uh, what were the legal grounds that allowed Tennessee to, to shut to the question was, what were the legal grounds? There was a lawsuit that actually then kind of all fell apart, the lawsuit. That's what wasn't what shut the program down. What they were trying to do was say this was a therapeutic uh, program, but that it wasn't having any oversight by the state. And because there were people in there who were on drugs, they were being administered to them. And, and so they tried to say, no, we are a separate thing because we're a ministry. And the, the state caved ultimately on their lawsuit. They backed away because they had all this, this federal lawsuit, which was funded by a Christian legal defense fund. What shut the program down ultimately was all the bad press that kept people from going to the program. And there was some behind the scenes work being done too because they were having adults and youth in sessions together which was highly inappropriate. And we brought that forward, and, and it come out in the film, but through, through blogging, through some, some protesting, through nonviolent direct action, they realized we can't afford to run two separate programs. And they just cut their losses, and they walked away from the youth program. It was too much bad press. Yes? I thought part of the problem was that uh, the government discovered that not one single member of the staff had any training in therapy, psychology, or whatever. So they couldn't be certified or in any way. Well, that's very true. They were woefully uh, uneducated when it comes to this. John Smith, the highest degree he holds is a high school diploma. 
which is nothing against people with a high school diploma, but if you're running a program of this magnitude, you should have some basic psychology, even some Bible. Like he was a reverend because his local church offered him a license to do that. He didn't go through seminary or anything. And so this came out too, and, and ultimately they hid behind the umbrella of we're a ministry so we don't have to uh, do the same rules. And this is what makes it very slippery from a legal perspective. How can you sue these places? They have this church and state separation that goes on, so they become untouchable. Also, you have parents who have the right to do a lot of things that are awful to their children, and they're protected by the law to do that. Yes? Have you ever read a book called The Last Time I Wore a Dress? The Last Time I Wore a Dress? No, I have not read that book. Okay, um, this is a memoir about a, a woman who, as a high school teenager, was committed by her parents voluntarily to a mental health facility uh -huh. um, because it, they couldn't handle her. Right. Um, it was just incidental that she happened to be a lesbian um, when she got there, she found that there were all kinds of people with all kinds of different problems in this facility. And the, the, uh, the caliber of uh, treatment administration and the caliber of treatment would be inappropriate even for healthy adults. Mm -hmm. These people all had medical degrees, and what they were doing was sillier than right. the kinds of things that went on in this facility. Sure. And she, when the book what year was that? She, she had years of uh, harassment by the medical, by 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 the medical organizations. Well, and there's a legacy that you know this started with the professional medical associations. And these Christian organizations actually draw on some of that literature, mix it with some Bible and, and Jesus to create this toxic mix that people save <laughs> under because it seems like it has such weighty authority. Was there a hand I saw in the back? Yes, thank you. Uh, can you elaborate? I, it seems that the redemption of John Smith, kind of, I mean, is that yeah. it's the Bible that he wrote John, John Smith, who was the director of Love and Action, who started the youth program, resigned, uh, and then he came out about a year ago with a public apology uh, that many of us who had been through the program were not completely satisfied with. It was one of those apologies, I'm sorry if I had done any harm, but it was far more than we had ever heard from him before. But, but most of us did not say, okay, thank you so much for your apology. Because we, I, we, I know, for me, I feel that um, apologizing is, is a very important thing, and forgiveness is a social tool. It should not just be handed out willy-nilly. And that someone really needs to acknowledge what they've done, and if they've done harm, to really work to make reparations and undo that damage. So he's been on a journey, he's been blogging about it, he's writing about it, he's getting in trouble now with a lot of the uh, ex-gay people who are currently still in business trying to change people, and they're saying, oh, he's gone off the deep end. Uh, and I've heard that privately people have approached him as, as he invited them to say, what have I done? And they've been very satisfied with the private conversations they have with him, that he's really moved along. He was at the premiere of the film in San Francisco, and he spoke. So I believe he's someone who's definitely on a, on a journey, and many of us have been dialoguing with him for years. Uh, and so that's exciting to see how stories, narrative, can help change people's perspective. And it's the stories of ex-gay survivors like the ones in the film and many, many others who have helped to show that this isn't just a silly thing to do. It doesn't, it's not that it just doesn't work. It's dangerous. So now in Catalonia and in Barcelona, they have an anti-homophobia law that includes a clause saying that it's illegal there to do reparative therapy. And they came after public testimony of people who have shared these stories. And this is what's really making a difference hearing the stories of ex-gay survivors. Any last questions before we move on? I've heard from you. I'll get back to you maybe if we have time, but up there, yes. Well, so how did you come to be involved in How did I become involved? In uh, 2003, I premiered my play, Do in Time, in the Homo Nomo Halfway House. And I premiered it in Memphis, where I went to Love and Action for two years. Uh, and so two years later, I'm hearing the story. And I'm like, before that, I was like researching all this stuff about youth, and I confronted John Smith. So the organizers contacted me, and they were like, we could use your help 
and with these protests, and uh, I'm, a, I'm a Quaker, and I've been involved with nonviolent direct action sort of work, and I said, you all are doing fine. You just, just keep doing what you're doing, and don't let the adults mess it up. We'll just step back and watch you do what you do. And, and so I went down to Memphis, I was part of the protest, I did my play then, and, we conti and I helped with the continual ongoing uh, work with it. And it was so helpful for me because I had been so harmed by that. And to be able to stand up in public in that forum was a very, very important step for me in my own recovery from that madness. Uh, and I was really, really grateful to be part of it. And I learned so much from those young protesters. All right, last word. It seemed like the phrase child abuse was carefully avoided. And could you say something about the ins and outs of that? Because it looks to me like what they were doing was child abuse. Yeah, there wasn't any intentional reason uh, to do that. We didn't want to manipulate people's words, and I think we, we, we had to, one of my jobs as a producer was to help cut the film, because it was like far too long, and so I was like, hack, 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 and I was like, poor, poor Morgan, he was like, please, I want, no, too long, too long. So some of that, of course, gets lost, but, um, but there was a lot in the, in the media at the time that we were talking very much that this is child abuse. There's no question about that. And that was part of the issue with the state of Tennessee. And it was one of the, a, a, another student that almost went through but didn't that, you know, is this a form of child abuse? And the, the sticky part is, again, it's parents doing this. It's ministry. They're saying they're trying to get help. And the separation of the state makes it almost legal to do this kind of child abuse. Thank you all very much for, for coming. I'll be happy to get any other questions. I really appreciate it. Thank you.